at six o'clock. The Falkland Islands, the British colony in the South Atlantic, has fallen. That's what Argentina said. It claims it's With the news that Argentina had seized the Falkland Islands, Britain's military bases were put on high alert. At precisely 10.15 this morning, HMS Invincible, flagship of this extraordinary fleet, slipped her moorings... At RAF Waddington, they watched Britain's mighty task force set sail to recapture the islands. The operation and Britain's commitment to this task force had begun. But they didn't think they'd be seeing any action. Our initial thought was, oh, dearie me, um, but can't see us being involved. Like most people, I heard about the invasion of the Falklands on the television or probably through radio news. I had not the faintest thought that we would be involved. Waddington had once been the home of Britain's nuclear V-Force. But the nuclear deterrent had been handed over to the Navy, and now the V-Force was facing extinction, not war. Its once shining fleet of nuclear Vulcan bombers was just three months away from being broken up by bulldozers. I think there was a feeling in the 80s, it was the end of an era. The Vulcans were closing down, they'd never been greatly improved and they weren't gonna be improved now. But all that was about to change. Prime Minister. It is a government's objective to see that the islands are freed from occupation and are returned to British administration at the earliest possible moment. As Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher stirred the nation into a patriotic frenzy, behind the scenes head of the RAF, Sir Michael Beetham, went to see her with a cunning plan. She was very enthusiastic. And I said, well, we've got some more work to do, but hopefully we can do it. Beetham's plan was breathtakingly bold. To send a lone Vulcan bomber 8,000 miles down to the Falklands to blow up the runway at Port Stanley. At one stroke, it would stop the Argentinians using the runway as a base to attack the task force and it would put the fear of God into the Argentinian people that the Vulcan might be back to bomb them. But there was a hitch. The Vulcan itself. Back in the coldest days of the Cold War, the Vulcan was state-of-the-art. It could be in the air within two minutes, delivering nuclear bombs into the heartlands of the Soviet Union. But devised in the late 1940s by the designer of the Lancaster, the sinister tin triangle was now showing its age. Well, it was a very nice aircraft. High tech, I'm not quite so sure. High tech maybe when it came into service, I mean, I can certainly remember showing ex-Bomber Command people over the Vulcan in the 80s, and they'd say, oh, look at that, Fred, we had that over Berlin in 1944. The technology in the Vulcan was very old. They, they said they had a bombing computer. This was driven by wheels, pulleys, bits of bicycle chain, etc. There was nothing electronic in it. On Good Friday, RAF Waddington was told to prepare for war.
then. Uncle Neil, who was a little bit older than the rest of us, said, well, I had a go and it was bloody awful, I tell you. It was the danger, most dangerous thing I've ever done. We said, oh, yes, Neil, tell us more. But he said it was so dangerous, that's the reason the Vulcan stopped doing it. Which, uh, yeah, it was a great start, really. <laughs> Carrying out this dangerous manoeuvre meant flying within feet of the refuelling tanker. To take fuel, the pilot then had to try to stick the Vulcan's probe into a metal basket trailing behind. There's all sorts of expressions to, to talk about air-to-air -air refuelling. Two insects mating in flight is, is one of them. It is, of course, arranging mid-air collisions between aircraft. Three of the top Vulcan crews were selected for training. But only one would fly the mission. The RAF did not have enough resources to refuel more than one Vulcan all the way to the Falklands. The chosen pilots were squadron leader Alistair Monty Montgomery, a charismatic and tough Scotsman. There was a rumour mill mainly started by fighter pilots that only fighter pilots could do this stuff of refuelling in the air. So we thought, hey, this is our chance, and we were desperate to have a go at it, believe me. Squadron leader John Reeve, also eager to have a crack at the runway. And I personally had absolutely no moral qualms whatsoever about doing this. And in terms of, you know, introspection, are we going to get away with this? Well, compared to having a go at Leningrad, uh, Port Stanley every time for me, please, if you don't mind. And lastly, the most junior of the bunch, Flight Lieutenant Martin Withers. I really genuinely thought that I was going to get through my whole time in the RAF without getting involved in any form of conflict, and without actually dropping a bomb on anybody in anger. And I must admit, I didn't like the idea of doing it. But do it, they must. And learning to refuel was just the first of many techniques they were going to have to master before they set off for war. Closing up behind a big tanker is really quite straightforward, but to actually get the probe into the basket was another matter. I spent the next 15 minutes missing to the left, missing to the right, missing below. Two, one, in. Nope. The crews soon find ways of describing the experience. Stabbing a wet donut, shoving very warm spaghetti up a cat's backside. Endless fun, frustrating until you get the hang of it. In peacetime, this would have taken months and months of intensive training. They only have two weeks. And if they fail, the task force would be at the mercy of Argentinian jets. With the Royal Navy Task Force now just two weeks away from the Falklands, the pressure was on. In charge of the Vulcan operation to bomb the runway at Port Stanley was Wing Commander Simon Baldwin. He lived on a diet of bacon sandwiches and pipe tobacco. I can't overemphasize how quickly things were happening. I had no time to think. We were just reacting. We were doing things and trying to make things work. Baldwin sent the crews on practice runs to attack the island of Garvey off the coast of Scotland. The crews had been skillfully trained to drop nuclear bombs, but it had been 10 years since they'd done any conventional bombing. Now they had to relearn techniques that dated back to World War II, using the same iron bombs dropped from Lancaster's. We dropped these bombs and you felt them go off sort of underneath you. And it was pretty exciting stuff just to do that without anyone shooting at you. The crews loved it, but the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds were understandably not happy. And the RSPB 
were absolutely devastated that we were wiping out seagulls at Garvey Island and requested that we stop doing it immediately. We, we were trying to go to war, but they didn't seem to appreciate that. We felt very sorry for the seagulls. He lies. <laughs> <laughs> The crews were going to have to hit a runway just 120 feet wide. This demanded a degree of accuracy not normally required with nuclear bombs. With the Vulcan, the accuracy that we had, we'd be quite lucky to hit the runway at all. And while the crew might miss the target, it looked increasingly likely that the Argentinians would hit the Vulcan. When Baldwin received the latest intelligence on the air defences at Port Stanley, it made sober reading. The dossier revealed that the Argentinians had state-of-the-art weaponry, including the Tiger Cat, built by the British. We were going in against the Argentinians with really modern radar-laid guns, uh, big shells, uh, explosive shells that they could fire at uh, goodness only knows how many per second, which could easily shoot uh, a Vulcan out of the sky. And going in at low level at night, I didn't really see how we could survive it. Crews were told to make their wills. You can't get around the fact it's a war. And you write out your will and you take the dog for a walk around Harmston Village and you think, I wonder if I'll ever see that place again. Right, should you be uh, captured at all, and uh, they will give you the opportunity to write a letter. And in case they did survive and were captured, they were taught how to write secret coded messages and what to do if they were paraded in front of enemy TV cameras. I, I found it quite amusing uh, when they said, what well, if you're telling the truth, scratch the right-hand side of your nose. If you're telling a lie under duress, scratch the left-hand side of your nose. We have to recover those islands, for the people on them are British, a British stock, and they still owe allegiance to the Crown. As the task force continues southwards, the government has given more details for merchant ships. With the task force a week away from the Falklands, Mrs. Thatcher still hoped that regular TV updates showing that the British mint business would be enough to send the Argentinians packing. Troops have been going through their weapons drill in readiness for a possible landing on the Falklands. The Royal Air Force has already shown pictures of their Vulcan bombers converted from the nuclear bombing role to that of conventional bombers. Exhausted from round-the-clock training, the Vulcan crews now found that their supposedly secret mission was part of that message. Watch out. The Brits are coming. To reach the Falklands, they would have to fly the bombers from Ascension Island, refueling them in midair. Our attitude to it was, oh, great, why don't you give them the date and time? You've given them everything else. On Monday the 26th, Sir Michael Beetham, head of the RAF, arrived to rally the troops and told them the mission was on. I really wanted then for the crews to see me and to wish them well. They were, after all, embarking, as I told them, on a dangerous mission, but they could do it. Reeve volunteered for the mission. For once, I put myself forward a little bit, because normally I'm not bothered. Let, give me an aircraft to fly, and I'm perfectly happy. But I remember saying, there is no way you can keep me out of this. Reeve landed the top job. Withers was told he would also be flying, but only as backup. Monty was sent to oversee the operation from Ascension. Soon, they would be off to war. Saying goodbye was not easy. It's a thing I'd never done before. I never, I never said goodbye and got off to, to war. I know it sounds very dramatic, but uh, it, it was possible that we might not return. It was probably ideal. I saw her for about half a minute. Just time to say bye-bye.
and the strangest thought crossed my mind. You know, my father was in the war, in the Navy during the war, and he didn't see my mother for, for years on end. And I thought, you know, in just a little way, this is what tens of thousands of people have done before. And now it's my turn. The night before we fly down, obviously you chat to the wife. Pat was tremendously supportive. And I had no qualms at all about going. I knew if anything happened to me, she'd look after the kids fine. There was no problem at all there. The two Vulcan crews prepare to take off for their midway base on Ascension Island. It was a miracle. In just three weeks, Waddington had gone from a peacetime base onto a full war footing. Transforming near obsolete bombers into new fighting machines. Eight hours later, the two Vulcans were circling the British island of Ascension. This remote volcanic outpost was a perfect base for the attack on Port Stanley. Ascension Island was, was amazing. It was just unbelievable. I still can remember just sort of circling around and seeing this strange looking island, a volcanic island. It looked like one big slag heap, really, on the uh, western side, very unattractive. The place was heaving, absolutely heaving. It really was something where something was happening, you think, oh, what place to be part of this. Ascension had become the busiest airport on the planet. The Vulcans arrived to find a huge armada of 12 Victor aircraft, the refueling tankers that would take the Vulcan down to the Falklands. That evening, with a 50th birthday party to celebrate, Withers and his crew hit the town. We had to find somewhere to go and celebrate that night. And we found more than one place to celebrate. Happy birthday! We had a few drinks, and we had a few drinks more. And suddenly, I'm 50 years old. We must have got to bed half past two in the morning, waking up with a little bit of a hangover the next day. Later that morning, the RAF sent a signal. The mission, codename Operation Black Buck, was on for 11 o'clock that night. It was time for one final check on the Vulcan's payload. Suddenly you're looking at 21, 1,000 bombs, and you realize that that means business. It was going to take a staggering 11 Victor tankers to refuel the one Vulcan on its 8,000-mile round trip. Group Captain Jeremy Price led the team to thrash out a plan. The refueling plan was very, very complex. It was something that had never been tried before, and a lot of the work was done on a five-pound pocket calculator bought in Swaffham Market. The plan is that this vast armada flies to the first refueling point. Half the victors refuel the other half, one victor refuels the Vulcan, and then those aircraft return to base. The procedure is repeated at the next refueling point, and again, until there's just one victor left to refuel the Vulcan before its final run into the target. And it was really a question of victors refueling, victors refueling, victors refueling, and it went on and on and on. And all the time, the formation was being reduced as one victor had given all its fuel and had to go back to Ascension. We had never seen anything like this refueling plan. The real unknown was just how much fuel that Vulcan was going to burn. We used the best information we had 
but we had a, a horrible nagging feeling that it might not be good enough. If they'd got the plan wrong, aircraft could end up ditching in the freezing South Atlantic Ocean with no hope of rescue. The air crews assembled for the final briefing on Ascension Island. OK, gentlemen, this is a secret briefing. In a few hours, the mission to bomb the runway at Port Stanley would be taking off on the 8,000-mile round trip. Me at the back. Yeah. Right. Well, as you know, the reason that we're here is to have a look at the whole refueling operation. It was the most complicated refueling plan I'd ever seen. To be honest, I picked up probably 60% of what was going on. Two hours. It's difficult to be I, I couldn't take it all in. It would take me ages, but I was able to turn to Dick Russell and say to him, Did you, do you understand that? And I had to draw a breath and say, uh, well, yes, I do, uh, with my fingers crossed behind my back. And these are the final points to remember. So and from that, cup of tea, disperse, out to the aircraft, ready to go. For lead John Reeve and his crew, it would be a hard 16 hours ahead. For reserve Martin Withers' his crew, it was supposed to be four hours and back for a beer. But that's if Withers could get into the air. He already had a problem. The microphone in his helmet, his bone dome, had stopped working. My first time going to war and uh, my bone dome doesn't work and I like my bone dome, I had that sense of security in it. In the back, Gordon Graham, the navigator, was also having to make do. The RAF didn't have any maps of the South Atlantic. Our navigator finished up using a, a map of the Northern Hemisphere turned upside down. Gordon changed the Azores into the Falklands. When we started the launch on that night, um, I felt that we had about a 40% chance of, uh, of success. There was almost a silence, but you could feel this air of expectancy. And then, bang. started up, and another, and another. And the noise grew and grew and grew. And then was a sudden change in the noise, and it was the first Vulcan starting. The Vulcan just looked fabulous, menacing, full of authority as it taxied onto the runway. I mean, I was desperately sorry not to be in it. throat as it went off down the runway, followed by the second one. 2306, second ball game. 2308, And then they were gone. And there was silence. In radio silence, to make sure there were no listening ears that could alert the Argentinians, the vast armada set off for the Falklands. But in the lead Vulcan, it wasn't about to be Reeves' night. Monty Python couldn't have done it any better. It all seemed to be going so well. The engines have started, the aircraft's working. What, what can possibly go wrong? I could hear this hissing sound from the window. Stand by. We got airborne, the whistling got worse, and the indication said the aircraft isn't pressurising. 
And I thought, no, no, it's happened once before in nine years on the V-Force. It can't be happening now. And it was. With no cabin pressure, Reeve and his crew will slowly freeze and run out of oxygen. There's no official drill for what to do, but you try all the things you can think of. We had sandwiches in polythene wrapping. I got the polythene off and tried to jam that in. I think I tried to jam a flying jacket, anything in there to try and stop it. But that's not working. Of course, we had to turn back then. Obviously not a happy bunny. Just four minutes after takeoff, and it's all starting to unravel. Reeve breaks radio silence to say he's returning to base. On the backup Vulcan, Withers also hears the transmission. We were now the primary Vulcan. We were on, and there was a deathly silence. Nobody actually said anything. Gulp, yes, it's us now. So I, I came up with a real sort of boy's own statement, like... Looks like we've got a job of work to do, fellas. The success of the whole mission now rests on Withers and his crew. Withers starts refueling with the victors. It's the first of four contacts over the eight-hour journey to the Falklands. But when the empty victors start returning to Ascension, they make a terrible discovery. The aircraft are so low on fuel, they have barely made it back. The victors coming back made it quite clear that the Vulcan is using more fuel than we had calculated. We were worried, I was worried. With not enough fuel, the whole mission is in jeopardy. But in radio silence, Withers in the Vulcan is blissfully unaware of the impending disaster. We weren't really keeping an eye on how much fuel we got. And it's a bit like, you know, in a, in a motor race, you know, that you just go around and as long as you've got fuel in the tank, that's all you're worried about. Then, with two refuelings left, the sortie hits a major electrical storm. It's always the same when you, the chips are down, you run into turbulence. And did we run into turbulence? And it's now that the last two remaining victors must refuel. Flying in the rear victor, Bob Tuxford knows if he can't get fuel, the mission is over. I was becoming acutely aware that the whole success of the mission now rested on the shoulders of, of me and my crew. Not only did he get in, he stayed in. Yep, fuel flares again. That's it. <laughs> Bob Tuxford, I take my hat off. Good job, Bob. But as Tuxford's Victor completes refueling and flies out of the storm, the crew make an alarming calculation. There isn't enough fuel. We were well short, to the point where we wouldn't actually be able to make the island back at Ascension. Tuxford asks the crew what they want to do. Right, uh, we either turn back now, pretty sharpish, or at least press on in the knowledge that we've got to come up with some sort of alternate plan. I need you all to speak now. 
and give me your view whether we continue or turn back. Without hesitation, each one of my four crew members said that we've come this far, we'll press on. Their decision means that they may be forced to ditch with little hope of rescue. Six and a half hours since leaving Ascension, it's time for the final refuel. But Tuxford, in the Victor, can't risk breaking radio silence to tell the Vulcan there's barely enough fuel to complete the mission. Everything seemed to be going well, taking fuel quite normally. And then, much to my surprise and Dick's surprise, sitting beside me, they put the light on. OK, Annie, give him the light. The red light flashed, and so we had to break. If the red light flashed, you, you break. Come what may, you break. Well, how much have we given it? But I said, this must be a mistake. 5,000 pounds, Captain. Because, you know, we still need about another 7,000 pounds of fuel. We, we'll have to abort the mission. The Vulcan had expected a full tank. But they've had all the fuel the Victor tanker can spare. So we broke off. I was absolutely amazed and, and actually very annoyed because I couldn't believe they could do that to us. As the victor turns to head back to Ascension, a furious Withers briefly breaks radio silence. We received two words. We're off. Which sounded like, we're off. What does he mean, we're off? Was he off to attack the target or was he off to ascension. We felt dejected. We felt that all our efforts had been in vain. In the Vulcan, Withers faces the hardest decision of his life, whether to give up the attack or press on and gamble the lives of his crew. Captain Martin Withers and his crew are within striking distance of the runway at Port Stanley. But their Vulcan bomber doesn't have enough fuel to get back to base. In theory, we should have then gone back to Ascension and aborted the whole attack. But because we'd come this far and the whole force had come this far, Martin decided we would carry on. I made it clear that that was what I wished to do. Nobody tried to say otherwise, so we, we pressed on. It's time for the attack. Withers takes the Vulcan down to 300 feet to get under the Argentinian radar. But navigator Gordon Graham can't work out exactly where they are. All his navigation systems are showing different positions. If we don't know where we are relative to the island, we could bomb anywhere. We could bomb the town itself. They switch on the ground scanning radar to get a fix. But this risks the Vulcan being picked up by the Argentinian defences. Uh, on the radar screen, there was nothing. Withers chances taking the Vulcan higher to see if that will help. Bang. The Falkland Islands appeared right in the middle of the radar screen, only about a mile away from where we uh, thought we were. However, just as we got up to about 500 feet, I suddenly picked out a search radar. The Argentinians have spotted them. But there's no turning back. Withers must now climb up for the final run-in. Pulled up using full power, fairly steep climb, to get to 10,000 feet. We had about a 20-mile run-in, and we felt very vulnerable, because you're sitting there. Uh, they know you're there.
I pulled the visor covers down. We thought flat would be coming up at us, you know, like you see in the war films. We hadn't done this before. Getting fairly close, we suddenly got a lock on from one of their fire control radars. So I thought, what can I do? So I switched on the Dash 10 jamming pod so that they'd be fooled into thinking we were in a different position. I opened the bomb doors early to make sure there wasn't a problem with the doors themselves. Alive, Nav radar Bob Wright checks the antique bombing computer. Its pulleys and bicycle chains must calculate to the split second when to release the bombs. Five. As we got to about two miles away Four. and the airfield was still lit up, that's when the bombs started to drop off. Three, two, one. dropped off at half second intervals 21 bombs from 10,000 feet it'll take 20 seconds for the bombs to hit the ground once the last bomb went Martin pulled the stick uh, climbing turn to the left to get away from any Argentinian air defense threats the sky opened up a short while after that with uh, every gun blazing Climb, you could see the flashes, obviously from the bombs going off. Now I felt a bit sorry for uh, the people on the ground. I mean, uh, not every day in your life you drop live bombs on, 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 on somebody. We had no idea at that point whether the bombs had actually hit the runway. It was a real sort of... <sighs> All over, you know, I'm, I'm safe now, uh, even though, yeah, we still did have quite a major problem to, to cope with. They still have to find their refueling tanker in thousands of square miles of Atlantic, and they have only a few hours of fuel left. But just as they thought they were out of range of Argentinian missiles, the whole of my radar warning receiver front sector lit up with threats. Unsure whether they are friend or foe, every anti-aircraft weapon of the British task force is now trained on the Vulcan. And I said a little prayer hoping that uh, somebody on board the ships was aware that we were a friendly coming towards them. This is one Quebec Delta. Over. I opened up on my radio, passed the pleasantries of the day, good morning, and I passed the code word superfuse to uh, let them know that we considered the attack had been a success. This is one Quebec Delta. Superfuse. The task force stands down, while the code word is also picked up 4,000 miles away back on Ascension. Suddenly out of the blue, somebody shouted, superfuse. I mean, fantastic. I mean, there was, there was elation everywhere. In Bob Tuxford's Victor, rapidly running out of fuel, the Vulcan's transmission tells them that at least their efforts were not in vain. <laughs> there was elation in our airplane. The whole mood changed. Well, let's hear it for the tin triangle. And after all, we were able to say, well, he's done it. He's done the job. But time is also running out for the crew of the Vulcan. There's no sight of the refueling tanker they're supposed to rendezvous with. The co-pilot stated he'd never seen a Vulcan flying with so little fuel in its tanks, which was quite a frightening situation to be in. We knew we had to make contact. If we didn't make contact, we were in the sea. We had immersion suits to keep us dry, we had dinghies, we had little radios, but I don't think any of us would have survived unless an absolute miracle happened. And the next thing I know, the Victor rolled out right in front of us. 
I can't tell you how that felt. I can't tell you. To me at the time, it was the loveliest sight in the world. Just in time, Tuxford's Victor was also met by a refueling tanker. There were quite a few whoops and hollers in the aeroplane as, as people celebrated. <laughs> And as the Vulcan neared ascension, it was time for them to celebrate too. Pryor puts on chariots of fire. I put that on the AO's tape recorder and we played it at full blast. <laughs> They'd survived. Withers and his crew had achieved the longest bombing raid in history. Thanks to 13 Victor tankers and 65 Victor crew. Not least to the final Victor that had sacrificed its fuel to get the Vulcan on target. There to meet Martin Withers with a can of beer was the pilot, Bob Tuxford. As I fought my way through the crowds, I'm not sure that Martin even recognized me in the first instance. But nevertheless, he received the can of beer nicely, and I decided that we'd done our bit that night, went off to our billet, and um, the rest was history. We didn't hear that whether we'd hit the runway until at least 24 hours later. We dropped 21 bombs, and the first one to, to explode was on the runway. The bomb put an end to Argentinian ambitions to use the runway for fast jet attacks on the task force. But it had been a close call. Just half a second later in releasing the bombs, and they might have missed altogether. The impact of that one bomb was to be felt far beyond Port Stanley Airfield. We had made a statement. We had made a, a huge statement that we were not giving up the Falkland Islands. Once that first bomb tumbled out of Martin's bomb bay, it, it's a declaration of war. And really, it was the opening shot of hostilities, and there was no going back. For Sir Michael Beetham, the raid had achieved its ultimate goal. The effect on the Argentinians was that uh, they could see that if we could do that, we could also do much more. Frightened that their cities would be attacked, the Argentinians withdrew their fighters to the mainland. The result was fewer Argentinian air attacks on British troops and ships. But for the Vulcan, the Falklands War was its first and last action. Six months after the war, it was scrapped. Withers Vulcan 607 now rests in peace beside the runway at Waddington, where, almost 30 years ago, it raced off to the Falklands.